Thank you, everyone, for tuning in for another week of Telehealth Fair Secrets to Success. Uh, this week, I'm pretty excited. So I met Alex by accident at the ATA uh, party uh, this year. To be honest, I wasn't even thinking about going there. I was just so exhausted after the ATA. But I was having to go there. There was only one person I talked to. That was Alex. I was just blown away by his insight on the whole telehealth space. His thinking it was like, I literally was like just blown away by thinking. And we know that telehealth, a lot of the people, a lot of the company ran into issue really is the business thinking, the business model. So I'm really excited having Alex join us this week in there. Um, Alex, um, <clears throat> Uh, before we get began, I also want to check out like how did you get into this? I know like people can read your formal bio on the web page in there. Like how did you get into the healthcare space? Um, I th so I basically got into healthcare right out of college. I, I worked for a tech consulting company that had broken up its divisions uh, between uh, you know finance, so on and so forth. And I kind of stumbled into you know being a little bit passionate about healthcare at the time. wasn't necessarily sure I was, but um, and was able to work with a few hospitals, mainly in New York. Um, we were building different software platforms for them. This is, you know, back in 2006 or so. Um, and so kind, kind of derived off of that. I think my, my, what drew me into it was when I was in college, I wanted to be a doctor, but I knew that uh, very quickly that maybe that wasn't my path, but I wanted to be in healthcare somehow. So when I had this opportunity, I did that. So that's kind of how I stumbled into it. And I just, you know, most of my career has been mostly healthcare. Oh, super in there. And one thing about Alex is he was aspiring to be a marathoner. So he's had that type of marathon, that dedication, the drive in there. Maybe that's one of the elements that go into Alex's success in there. And also, Alex, you, you were one of the first uh, people at ZogDoc in there, right? So how was that like to be a... Yeah, uh, just, it was pretty cool. I mean, you know, you, you get a chance to... Uh, quit everything you're doing to go go work with a great group of people and uh, you know pretty early on so it was a lot of fun um, was able to take my experience there and move it on to the next phases of my career so. super in there so how about uh, Alex I know you have a couple of slides to share maybe what we'll, uh, turn the floor to you maybe you can share some of your thoughts in there then after that we'll do some open QA with our audience sure we'll we'll, we'll go through uh, some of these slides here and then um, you know Kind of, kind of derive it from there. Uh, <clears throat> so our basic premise here is kind of the some of the strategies that, that I've seen in digital healthcare that have worked um, generally, and um, how maybe we should start to pivot more of telehealth as just the general healthcare. Um, this was my background, but I think everybody kind of sees that. Um, so I start off everything with kind of healthcare as a mindset. It's one of the things I've learned um, kind of many years ago was um, the reason why healthcare is so hard to disrupt and change is because health, people already have their minds set onto what healthcare actually is. And so to make them change the way they do things or the way it's delivered, I think makes it much more uh, difficult. So I think you have to kind of, you know, take a step back and, and if you're an entrepreneur or you're a doctor um, in the space, you have to really look at um, the, the barriers to entry and they're, they're much higher than if you were to go into maybe the auto industry where you can create something or invent something. So you know, people have a different type of mindset in healthcare. So I always have this top, top of mind as to when I help or advise other companies um, in terms of how they're going to sell their product or how they're going to position their product um, because you know, it, it really shows them that the, the path may be a little bit longer, but it, it's always worth it. <clears throat> so. Um, I have five focuses, so I talk about passion and emotion. There's a big difference, but you have to have both. Um, there's a difference between your customer and your consumer, who you're selling to and who's actually using the product. Um, I always believe in being a full market expert. Um, I believe having your um, offering always being uh, raw and open, and then always making your products uh, or your product uh, to be replicated to, you know, in terms of sales. Um, so this is like kind of like business one on one a little bit, but you know tailored towards healthcare. So um, I look at healthcare in terms of you know what is your past and, and you know basic definition is um, it's the reason why you're here, right? So if you're positively passionate, um, you're going to be easily be able to validate and motivate your team uh, around the product, um, and then it, it creates a great, clear, and honest emotion. So um, so as you you grow or replicate your product. 
um, people inside your organization will replicate how you feel, how you're passionate. Um, one of the things that I've seen or tend to see is um, kind of a negative passion um, around any type of organization. It doesn't have to be healthcare, um, where uh, founders or entrepreneurs or even high-level executives will have kind of this tunnel vision where their product is built to be one way and they lack the um, interest in listening to how to tweak it, how to make it better. And so uh, it, these are always typically negative uh, factors to growing um, a business, especially in healthcare. And so um, I look at that and I say, when, when you have that tunnel vision, you'll ten, tend to make either poor decisions or poorly informed decisions because you, you, you feel like it's your way of the highway. And so that'll negatively impact the way your emotion is around kind of your mission. Um, and a lot of times what I'll see is um, uh, founders or companies, uh, you know, building or launching new products in terms with a vendetta against the competitor. They'll have blinders on it and, you know, who, who knows what happens in the end. Sometimes they could pivot. A lot of times they, they don't and it's usually a negative effect. So I look at, and this is one of the, the biggest pillars in, in healthcare is who's your customer versus who's your consumer. And I always put the word patient up here because at the end of the day, 100% of your products are made for the patient. It doesn't necessarily mean 100% of your products are made for the providers or the payers. And so um, we have to know the difference in how the patient is going to be the user in every product, right? And so when we divide it up, it's a simple definition based. Um, your, consume, your customer is going to be the person actually buying it. Um, most likely then they are a user of some sort and then they are most likely the administrator. So they, they control all aspects. This is very relevant in, in healthcare software, healthcare, uh, digital healthcare, so on and so forth. Um, your, your consumer, which is the way you're marketing your product, the way you're positioning your offering is going to be your end user um, and who is affected. So almost 100% of the time, this person is going to be a patient. And so um, whenever I advise um, uh, companies, and I, I do it in my current uh, role here at, at Quicker Care, is we, we position our offering towards the patient. How are they going to access or how are they going to be affected? And so when, when you position your, your product in that effect, um, you'll, you'll tend to get doctors to then understand better. And that's just, you know, from my experience has been when you can explain your product from a consumer perspective, the customers are, even if the customer isn't necessarily the consumer, the, the, the customer is going to understand how the end result is going to benefit them. Um, uh, I, being a full market expert um, is, is a very important factor, um, especially in today's day when it comes down to how people are going to pay. Um, in telehealth, we've, we've seen this issue over the last probably five years fluctuate up and down into what, what's going to happen. And so I, I try to be as educated as I can or as an organization as a whole, collaborate to make sure we are educated to what's going on in, in all factors of healthcare. And I always have it kind of quoted as it's the knowledge of what you can and cannot control, right? And so when we look to, you know, kind of the technology side is, you know, knowing in the market, not just your company, but any of the other companies that are out there, what, what are the user experiences that are working? What's the security that's, that's, that's up to date? Um, is it open source? It, it, it doesn't need to be integrated. You know, these are all important factors in terms of deployment, in terms of how you sell it. Um, I um, always have something on my team that's better than I am at it, um, understanding all of the healthcare effects. So is your product going to produce better results? Or are products around you producing better results that you can then aid into those products? So kind of no, knowing what the indirect um, business ties are to other products out in the industry. Um, I always look at trends. I mean, every day I get emails. Um, my, my colleagues, my colleagues in the industry, they get emails. Um, I'm part of Startup Health, so you know they obviously are great at doing this, um, telling us where the trends are, whether it be investment dollars, where whether it be FDA regulations, things like that, and you, wh whether it be outside the U.S. because not everybody's in the U.S. obviously. So um, I always try to keep up to that and see how some of the new stuff that's going on can affect my business or affect the businesses around me, especially in telehealth. And I'll get to some of the telehealth stuff at the end. Um, and lastly is regulation. You know, knowing what the medical boards are thinking about your product or products like yours um, being you know, distributed to the, the general public, the FDA, um, and then the, like the big, you know, uh, uh, one we're talking about right now is legislation. What's going on in D.C. is, you know, highly important to a lot of companies that they're kind of scared that maybe, you know, people aren't going to be able to pay to go to the doctor anymore or see a doctor. So we're 
you know, we have to make, make sure we're not naive to the, those things. Um, I, I, kind of, I kind of love the, this section. Um, one of the things, uh, as opposed to other industries, um, I think you, you could really do a good job at here is uh, being raw in your messaging. And I actually use a really good, good example here um, of Dollar Shave Club. Actually, I love the, uh, the marketing of their um, video that they had. And so it was very simple. Um, it showed it, it was a huge pain point, especially, you know, if, you know, we all get it. Men typically get it when you when you have to go and buy razors, it's very expensive. And so, but nobody ever disrupted it. Nobody cared. And so, you know, here's a company who made a very raw and upfront, honest uh, view of the industry and where it was. Um, and they had that hockey stick approach happen to them very quickly, right? They were able to grow quickly. They went to a billion dollars in revenue. They ended up selling. I mean, it was it was insane. So I, I see when I look at healthcare companies, um, especially digital healthcare companies, sometimes they avoid the raw emotion of what your product can impact. Um, and I always say it's totally okay to tell people that. You know, we are, especially if it's healthcare buying healthcare, and you're a B two B role. Like you know, we we all kind of get it. We 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 talk about bodily functions every day, or we understand it. So we should never be embarrassed of what our product does. And so I use this example. I know it's a little less healthcare, it's more health hygiene, but um, it was, I think we can all re relate to that commercial um, really well. <clears throat> so replicate, as a salesperson, um, generally all those things need to kind of align. And then as you build a product, how do you simplify the, the product to make sure that it's replicable, right? So software, we, we look at it as, you know, you need to sell to X doctors, it's gonna cost you X amount, and what is that going to be? Um, and I think that, uh, you know, once you can figure out how you replicate your product um, in terms of the offering, in terms of the way it's sold, you will see exponential growth as long as, you know, obviously the product is in a market where it can have exponential growth. So um, I look at it as, you know, if we tore, tore down all the MBA uh, uh, business models out there, and I actually did this with one of my clients a couple of years ago, um, and I'll show kind of what I did. Um, I, I, I said, what do we copy and paste? So copy and paste meaning one client or these three clients bought the product because of X. So let's copy and paste that to the next clients. Um, you look at the way your market inside of your market, the way it treats you and where the patterns of buying are inside of that. Um, can you train that model to as many people as you can and then have a very short learning curve in terms of sales? And then once you can master those three, you literally have um, that hockey stick approach. Um, I think one of the disclaimers I talked to a lot of people, and it's funny, I read an article very recently about this, is it's okay to, not, to be a $100 million company. There's no, there's no shame. That's a great company. Um, not every product is going to be a billion dollar company, um, even in healthcare. Right, I mean, healthcare. We we've only seen a few. We've seen a lot of companies that are valued at 50, 100 million, then they have an exit, and um, that's okay, right? Um, and so I think that we just always need to be honest about how big our personal market is, but make sure we're attacking to get the biggest piece of the pie. So I actually have an example of a complex replication. I worked with a client um, about two years ago, two and a half years ago, and they actually had an online platform for training. So it was like an ed tech. Um, crossover platform for healthcare. So they basically sold libraries to uh, uh, um, uh, training facilities and, and uh, home healthcare. And so uh, at first, when they first started coming way well before uh, the team of us went, went into help them go enterprise, they sold libraries. And so um, in the midst of kind of uh, uh, going down that road, they realized that they were really a platform play. So people should subscribe to the platform and then pick what libraries they wanted. And one of the things that they learned is that once they admitted that that was their play, it wasn't about, you know, subject matter or selling libraries, they literally grew exponential and they ended up selling for uh, $600 million, I think back in uh, 15 or 16. But, um, and so, you know, that honest pivot showed that they were, you know, their passion and their emotions were aligned properly <clears throat> and that they were willing to make the right tweaks to say, our offering isn't about subject matter, it was actually about um, about a, a platform and then when people are in the platform they could always buy more buy less and so once they were able to do that they I mean they had somewhere around 200,000 users within a first year so um, definitely something we, we, we need to look at I mean that's a pretty difficult play because ed tech is very difficult and those platforms are are one in a million so there's there's tons of them out there so 
Um, so as uh, Milton and I have talked about it quite frequently and a lot is kind of like where does this all kind of play in telehealth? And I always, you know, there's a there's a big. I live in Orlando, so there's a there's a big interest in medical city here, and and we all we talked a lot about telehealth down here and new uh, new exciting ways to deliver healthcare. And you know, one of the things concept I've come up with was Life 3.0. Instead of talking about Health 2.0 and all these you know things that are kind of you know ten years old or or so, is where are we going to be in terms of delivery, in terms of the actual care of people, right? Right, and the near future. And so we have to get rid of telehealth and just you know integrate it into health, and that's going to be a vital piece of how telehealth grows in the next probably five to ten years. Um, when I look at passion, one of the things that um, I think you know, instead of trying to aggregate patients to use us. Um, the one, one cool thing about anywhere we live is uh, health systems are still fairly trusted, right? So uh, I trust the health system that, that's close by me. I know the doctors there, they're really well. So instead of trying to build a brand against them and aggregate patients to use our telehealth platform, the center of focus that's white label let's let's make them better connected to their community right that that should be maybe our passion instead of just the patient and so um, once you can do that we can manage populations better so you know maybe the passion being you know a better health connected community um, and then it drives a really good feeling in that community so with that community's health care and i use a really cheesy line you're in good hands uh, just like all state it's pretty bad but i try to be funny i'm not that funny so um when I kind of skip over, when I look at, at telehealth, um, one of the important factors are, um, you know, uh, in terms of who's the customer and who's the, the consumer, um, it's, you know, ding, 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 it's always patients here. Um, I think we need to break it down to not just like patient or people or whoever, it's who is the biggest market for telehealth. And it's going to be any person that's working class that's between the age of 23 and 55 and they most likely have a family. They don't have to, but most likely. So these, this is the this is the consumer we need to focus on. It isn't it isn't the employer? It isn't necessarily just the health system. It's you know how do I get that person who's in that classification of people to have a really good user experience with my client who's ex hospital? And how can we continue to get them to use telehealth? Because the more they use it, the more we can expand on what's covered, what's performed in telehealth, and then telehealth could just become part of health. So. Um, I think we need to start, I, I, and I, I see a little bit of it shifting in the last year or so, but I think that kind of needs to be the, the near focus is like just how easy can we get people who are, you know, working class in that age range and most likely families to use. And one of the good things that I see out there are some devices to help aid in, into <clears throat> um, telehealth where, you know, doctors can now get vitals at home. If they have a scale, they can get weight. So now we can have more continual population management with, with telehealth, which, which I think then that would, is what's going to make telehealth just healthcare. Um, when I look about full market expert, and this is something that Milton and I have actually chatted about very briefly, but not, not too in depth, is you know, when you talk about technology, you know, what, what's most likely used the most, right? So you have chat, you have video, you have calling, right? I mean, those are the three types of technology we're using now. Um, I, I look at chat as kind of the kind of next pinnacle. Um, today we use cell phones as you know outside of healthcare for everything and nobody picks up the phone to answer a call right so um, I don't even really like to be on this video call right now and so uh, you know if we chat we if we could figure out a way to integrate more chat technology uh, and trust that more more frequently then I, I think that then the users will grab on to telehealth much faster um, obviously white labeling let's let the health systems kind of you know be a good brand out there uh, unless if you know, a tech company really comes about that's both the provider and the health system and the insurer. I mean, that, that could be the, the, the play, but we'll, we'll see. Um, in terms of healthcare is, you know, what, what's actually being covered um, in, in terms of a visit? So are they home virtual visits? Is it remote monitoring from hospital to hospital, specialist to hospital? Um, I think that we need to make sure we're tackling all those in terms of, of care. I think one, one of the things that, especially remote monitoring, can tackle is um, is this shortage of doctors we, we we talk about? I think that we could kind of you know get talk doctors that are specialists then talk to more patients. And so if they're able to do it remotely, it's it's an exciting time. Um, when I when I look at trends, um, I'm seeing that there 
um, you know, right now in the market we have, you know, a benefits problem, right? People are getting covered, then they're not going to get covered. And so we have to obviously be conscientious of that. You know, not being covered doesn't mean telehealth is going to have an issue because if people don't have insurance but they need to see a doctor, some people will pay $49. So there's, there's pros and cons to a lot of it, but we need to be mindful of some of the trends that are happening. Um, and then lastly is prescribing, right? I mean, from a regulation perspective, um, I, and I, it was an article I think that VC had uh, posted today was um, what's going on in Texas and they're kind of jumping and, and they're, they're saying let's come back to telehealth and um, I think one of the things is once we can start trusting telehealth more more events can get prescriptions and then more people can have a benefit so as we kind of evolve that uh, I think that then more of the tech community can really embrace you know rolling out more technology and, and selling selling something that's that's more beneficial um, in terms of your offering, in terms of telehealth offering, and, and one of the things that I like, instead of a general in the upper right hand corner, I show you know families, and this is like a very common um, uh, offering pivot uh, position that I see a lot of telehealth companies go after. I think this is great, but it's very general. Um, one offering that had you know telehealth, the first telehealth visits most likely were were psych visits. Um, that's definitely great. I think you're you're fine with that. But I think that a good recommendation where I see uh, telehealth going is talking about specific events. You know, years ago I used to sell. You know, uh, you know, a patient doesn't want to make an appointment because of a rash. Um, that was always, you know, kind of my sales pitch. And doctors understood that. Patients understood that. So we had you get both users. I think that um, telehealth has to have the same. You know, we we position our offerings around a specific event. You know, that maybe that same rash issue. You know, I, I have a rash. Let me take a picture of it. Send it to my doctor. Um, once we could sell more of that, um, just like we do with, you know, things like Cialis and Vi Viagra, we have this whole like makeup out there, and then people really grab onto what it is, both doctor and patient. Um, once we have that, I think that um, the companies that embrace that as their position will, you know, grow much faster than everybody else in healthcare and, and telehealth. Um, and a replicable model is going to be um, isn't really necessarily the 100% challenge today. I think. A lot of the platforms that I see out there are replicating what they're doing. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily always the right thing. I think the the strongest model from a technology company or startup perspective is going to be a platform that's white labeled that does both video and chat. <clears throat> that will be the the front player for all of telehealth because they're going to partner with more health systems and not try to take away, I guess, their kind of brand awareness. And I think as Next five years, maybe ten years, comes about the 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 players that are kind of in that realm. They're going to just you know close bigger deals left and right with health systems and maybe insurance companies. And so I think uh, we're we're starting to see that pivot now that appointments are starting to be on a rise um, with telehealth, which I think is a good thing. Um, we can then start to show the more regular people are going to use telehealth. So and that's kind of it. I guess uh, open. Alex, thank you so much for that really, really thoughtful uh, presentation. and really appreciate it. Sure. Um, so I guess, Alex, you talked about like life 3.0 in there. Can you just describe a bit about what does that mean? Yeah, I think it's really about um, how healthcare is managed. Um, you know, today, today it's managed still through this uh, kind of fragmented system where, you know, you get sick, you go here. or you know, if you're a patient, you go to your doctor. Um, I, I look at it as your doctor is integrated with your everyday life. So if it's, let's just use an app perspective, a doc, you could then um, get managed on a, you know, bi-yearly or every quarter basis, give updates to your doctor. When you do get sick, before you jump to an urgent care in an ER, you could chat with your doctor online. I think that's how we become more of a, an integrated managed population. And so once we can um, stand behind a, a one or two technologies that kind of make that happen and that more people adopt that uh, uh, passion of it and that a lot of that has to do with, you know, being able to um, integrate chat more frequently with, with a doctor, um, I think that's how we get to the next stage of managing people's health care, re reducing the cost, catching illness before it happens because the doctor or the health system is getting more touches from the patient or more 
more uh, more uh, more data from the patient on the, on a daily basis or or a yearly basis. Got it. That makes sense. So you um so you, you know so you talk about you're focused on like the 23 to 55 years so in there, but the biggest cost often in the healthcare is really the elderly, the chronic commitment in there. Right? You know what? Uh, I can I ask you why don't you focus on like that the part? Um, I look at the other age, the age group that I talk about as kind of your low-hanging fruit. I mean, yes, it's not the biggest cost now, but in 20 years, those people who are 55 are now 75, right? They are the elderly. And so it's all about a learning curve and education, and as in any industry, education can be very expensive. And um, if I try to tell an 85-year-old how to use telehealth today and they've never really even used a smartphone, it's okay. going to be a very difficult process. I'm not saying we should abandon those people. Um, I think that we're still going to be much more hands-on with the elderly population today, but I think that as we integrate more of these technologies with the kind of, you know, eight, you know that 23 to 55 age group now, that 20 years from now, it's not like they're going to have to learn how to use their new smartphone. I mean, unless it's, you know, obviously smartphones are obsolete, we've got a new technology, but I don't see that being the case. Got it, honestly. So I have a question from the audience. Uh, Shirley is asking, so how do we uh, better educate a uh, patient that telehealth is a better alternative? There? And what are the, some of the ways you actually do, you recommend people do this? You know, I, it's all about uh, outreach. I think it, it depends on the platform and the setting. Uh, I, I actually think a strong message comes from the health system specifically. Um, you know, I, I would never want to battle a health system in terms of content ex expertise because they're the ones educated to be our doctors and they take an oath to make sure everybody's healthy. So I think as we get more, you know, healthcare or hospital partners to partner on that messaging um, through their means uh, or through kind of a collective mean in their specific communities, they already have that level of trust in the community. So as, as as we get one or two, like in Orlando, we have a really good children's hospital here. It's you know kind of you know somewhat national. Um, they have a great telehealth program, and because they're fairly tr they're very well trusted, they were able to market internally inside their uh, network of patients. And now they're seeing leaps and bounds over the last two years of all that legwork of patients actually using their technology more frequently. So I think really partnering at that level is going to be so much so much better. Um, so much more effective and uh, very cost prohibitive, right? Because you're not you're not trying to start from scratch and you know build your own network. So, got it. And, uh, so how do you see, like, for example, like you know, like things like the Teladoc, American Well, the MD Live, right? They have their brands in there. Like, if what you're saying is really people need to trust a local brand, you know, a local hospital. In there. I mean, do you predict that these companies will run into trouble later on, or how? I mean, it's it's very possible. Um, I I wouldn't speak uh, you know positively or negatively against against them. I think they they're trailblazers, right? At the end of the day, they they've said let's we're going to go out the market and see what it tells us. Um, I think you know it's it's going to be a very difficult battle to be the brand in this specific form of healthcare because it's changing the delivery of the care, right? And so because now they have to now go out and get all their own doctors and have people on call and and do all that. Um, I think one thing that we've learned, uh, especially in the in the recent year or so, is that even even the younger patients still trust their local network more um, because it's it's around them every day, right? And so you know, like I don't just go online and you know go and do a search uh, on an ailment and trust what the internet tells me. I want to trust what um, my doctors tell me or Doc, medical professionals will, are going to tell me that are, that are in the industry. So I, I think that if we could get to that point, then um, maybe the play will be somebody who's less tele telehealth, more telehealth finder, if that makes sense, and okay. they don't own any piece of it. They're just like a find uh, okay. technology. But I, I, that would be the only kind of brand that could have that. And they would have to do a lot of SEO or they'd spend mm -hmm. a lot of money on marketing to acquire those patients. So. <laughs> That, that makes a lot of sense in there. So uh, to be honest, I also sort of worry about some of these sort of major brands because I definitely see that almost like in some sense they're fight to, today. They're they have embedded into a lot of the healthcare system for after hour coverage and all these things. But there is a, in some intrinsic they're sort of fighting like whose doctor pool are you using in there? Sure. My heart ultimately is the healthcare system. They have thousands of doctors. Sure. Well, I mean, if I look at my current business, so at Clear Care, we work with emergency rooms and. 
urgent care facilities to help them kind of lower their wait times and so forth. Um, one of the things that you know I've learned over the last 10 years um, for a long time now is that online you know Google is still very prevalent right we're all using it a majority of patients are doing a search first like hey I have a headache what is it and they'll use Google first right or they could use WebMD but that's you know beside the point um, and so be, because of that I don't always want to compete against them online because the, the cost of doing business even though you may think it's worth it the level of profit could be very low. And I'm not saying it always is, but if I'm spending $10 to acquire a patient and I'm only making 12 on the patient, that, that $2 margin, it's, it may not make sense, right? It may never let my business grow fast enough. So I think that we have to look at models and, and all startups, you know, in the Valley or New York or wherever we are, um, I think we're all starting to learn that, you know, revenue is king and, you know, being a salesperson at, uh, by, by my core, um, we, we, I know this, right? We, you only live and die if you are making money. Um, yeah. If you're not making money, then there's, um, exactly. there's no business. So. Got it. So in terms of like, for example, like Teladoc, like last year, right, they had about, you know, I think they had about $123 million in revenue. They lost about, I think it's about 60 or 65 around. I mean, I think that like similar for these are American well, where these are all like also losing money. The, this direct to consumer, I think we hear like Dr. Demand has some, you know. Sure. Do you, so for that $49, this in there, could that ever be profitable? Or is that just intrinsically that business model is just like tough to? Uh, no, I mean, I, I, I don't see, you know, I don't see a way that at $49 we can continue. You have to, I mean, as a consultant, you you have to make you know a level of profit and or yeah. you don't have any money to pay your bills. So I mean, it's I hate to say it as crude as you can, but that's the way it is. And so a fee for service business, which forty nine dollars, that's you're paying a fee for service. It's not like there's continual revenue there. Um, there has to be a level of profit in every visit, and doctors are only going to accept, and doctors shouldn't accept too much less, right? And so I I think that that is probably one of the biggest drivers against a, a able to make you know make a profit in the business now I think with and I'm, I'm a big believer in this with more of a home device um, trusting that the what the patient is telling the doctor more I think then reimbursement will go up um, I think 80 to 90 dollars is probably the range that we would see it's still less than an in-person visit mm -hmm. but if that it's that level of um, uh, uh, reimbursement that I think that the industry will get to and once we get there then yes I think there will be ability to make more money in in the business and and have a have it where they can then uh, do more R&D for the future. Uh, that, that makes sense. So I have a question from the audience from Mike so he's asking so for example uh, what are the employers like looking for when assessing telehealth products. I get the question, uh, the context right there is, you know, the employers a lot of times they're selling, they're driving a lot of these are innovations for interesting uh, lower the cost of healthcare, all these things. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, with, especially, you know, you talk about employers, I look at employers and payers, right? If you look at the employer market, um, employers can drive more change than any of us um, because they could tell their, their, their payer I want this or I'm going to another payer and that's yeah. that's fantastic um, so I think that you know employers can drive that level I think they're obviously very motivated in reducing their own premiums which they definitely should be um, I think there's a payer problem there but I, that's another discussion um, but I, I, I think that they can reduce their, their premium with that but I also think it's also about better wellness so I think if, if we look at all, all the different pillars in healthcare and I, I hate dividing them up because really we need to get down to one pillar and that's just, you know, healthcare. But um, when you look at it, wellness and telehealth should start to blend a little bit because if once our, you know, employees of our companies are using telehealth, now they're using tele-diets, right? So now they're talking to a dietitian, they're talking to, you know, maybe somebody for weight loss or quit smoking and so on and so forth. Now patients are touching their, their kind of network of, of uh, healthcare providers more um, and the provider now gets a patient or gets an employee who stays at work longer or has less sick days, um, is happier, more productive. So I think there's a really great end result, but you still have to promote that level of change, um, get people to use it, and then, you know, to, 
trying to jump over to the legislation side, make sure the, med the medical boards are, you know, reimbursing better, letting patients say if they're sick, they can just go get a prescription. You know, I mean, I think that we need to get to that level of trust. Got it. That makes sense. So I have a uh, question from the audience, Michael, he's asking it. So uh, why do you think that the CMS is continuing to be sort of pretty slow from reimbursing telehealth, adapting to sort of more like new technologies and so on? I mean, I, you know, anything with the government, I think sometimes is uh, slow to adopt new, new technology. Uh, so the FDA process is, uh, you know, quite lengthy, even for, you know, smaller classifications. But, um, you know, I think one of the things that is a, a big driver is prescription drugs. I mean, they don't want to see doctors then fall into this pit where you got a back pain, I'll give you pain med, right? And you never see the patient, right? And so I think they, you know, they have, you know, the general public, um, best interest. It's hard to, to believe that, but I definitely believe that they have the, the better interest. Um, I think if they had more input from the industry and not just from health systems, but I also think from more health tech companies, um, I see very few kind of get into the conversational mix there. Um, I think, you know, actually at, you know, to not, for no plug at all, Startup Health, great at doing that. Those guys are phenomenal. They have a really good plug into kind of, you know, some government stuff. They're not afraid to, to, to be a part of that. I know from a business perspective, a lot of people are because it's, you know, political. But I think a lot of that is once you kind of get the round robin of healthcare, that's tech, it's, it's the actual healthcare providers, and then even the patients, which were all patients, then I do think that they'll start to lift that. But, you know, until that happens, then I, I think still see, see things very slowly to, 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 to change. Yeah, I think anytime government, in fact, anytime you have a big group of people, decision, everything is slow. I think that's just a law of human nature. Yeah, it's a, it's a um, very difficult process. <laughs> yeah, uh, we have a question for Lynn. Um, so she's asking, so for example, um, so as a small private uh, psychotherapy practice, so what are some of the most effective ways to market a telehealth to a patient? Do you have any you know, like, marketing yeah. advice for a small uh, practice? You know, I would say um, small practices could, especially in psychiatry um, uh, or psychotherapy, a a anything that has to do with therapeutics that's not maybe physical therapy, um, can actually have a really good market. If you already have an, a, a, a practice, um, you can probably get more touches out of your patient. You know, in, in, in between in-person appointments, you do a, you know, 30-minute call or a 30-minute um, uh, visit with uh, patients. And I would send out emails to them. I would you know, get text messages. I mean, I'm assuming we're all kind of get, getting that, you know, through patient portals and things like that. And so I would think of yourself as a small marketing agency. I mean, I, I run a small healthcare company um, with, with just around 10 employees and um, we're growing um, very well. But um, one of the things that we're able to look like we have a really big marketing team, we do outsource a lot, um, mm -hmm. but we use a lot of these automated systems. Doctors could do the same. I see it all the time. They, they, they market to their patients, they get them to sign up on their patient portals, and then they get them to use telehealth, telechat. This is why I think chat would be very relevant. You know, if you're a psychotherapy um, uh, group and, you know, you have, you know, patients that may be a manic depressant or so on and so forth, I think that if they just feel off that day, they could text you or they could get onto the, the, the chat system and then they could, you know, send a text and, you know, there's probably some type of collective rate you could charge for that that's, you know, when it equals up to an hour, you can charge, you know, your, your $49 or whatever. So I, I think that if you can incorporate more of that, it's like that free flow. Instead of having hours of 8 to eight to 5 or 9 to 5, you're 24-7 without really being 24-7. Wow. So, for, for example, for one of these were smaller practices, so how much would you recommend should be the marketing dollar, right? Is there? Um, it, I mean, I always recommend 10% of what you anticipate to make for the year because um, that always can make – once you're an established practice with kind of permanent patients, and there's like, then you could drop it down to maybe five percent. But you know, these independent practices, ten percent of what you make should go back into marketing. You need okay. to always re remarket and make sure that you know. I would always tell doctors this because we all live in you know forty, you know, out of the top forty cities, eight it's eighty-two percent of Americans, and so most cities are transient, and so you're going to lose people from moving and from doing X, Y, and Z. Maybe not too far. So you got to make sure you're doing that. Got it. So do you have any? Um... I recommend that like these sort of firms outsource for like people can use for how big I, I know like when I work with a lot of physicians, something is like overwhelming, right? There's like, like how do you even you know get your get the help? Um, 
I mean, there's there's quite a few platforms out there that are you know inexpensive. I mean, I personally, you know, this isn't to this isn't advertising anybody. This is what I personally would use. Um, I use Mailchimp or I will use like a HubSpot. I mean, those those technologies are great. They're inexpensive. They're easy to use. Um, okay. You can integrate them into Gmail, which is phenomenal. Um, so that you don't, you know, depending on if you're using Outlook, if you're using Outlook, you do the same as well. That integrates. So if you are using, if you do use those, once you're kind of trained on how to use it, you can automate things where, you know, maybe for 30 minutes a month you're actually spending time on there. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, and, that, and you need to get to that point because if you're independent, you maybe have one employee, um, you don't have time to make, start making cold calls like, like a salesperson would, right? You don't have time to do that. You need to, you need to treat patients. So. Mm -hmm. Got it, okay. So I have an audience question on Charles. He's asking, so um, could you say a bit about, like, I think your company the, uh, is called Quicker Care for the urgent yep. care in there. Could you, I mean, there's a lot of these for you know, urgent care. Is that like, is there anything special angle that you take it to that? Sure. Um, my, my colleague and I, um, about a year and a half ago when we were, we didn't even really, you know, tend to start a company, I don't think, uh, we looked at what, you know, in healthcare, what was missing, and um, you know, if, if you look outside of telehealth, um, ur urgent care and uh, emergency rooms have grown 18% over the last three years, right? So, actually, considered fastest growing piece of healthcare right now. And a part of it is, you know, urgent cares are trying to act more like your your uh, community care, right? Mm -hmm. Their cost is a little bit lower now, and some some settings, and so on and so forth. So. So when we were looking at it, we saw these other platforms that, you know, I even you know, helped out one at one point that did online check-in or did patient registration online. But the, the, the problem is that the market is so competitive online that the small guys all get eaten up and the big guys, are just they're just spending big dollars to get patients to come to their door, right? And so what we said, why don't we centralize it? Let people find the location, find the lowest wait time. Um, nobody was really doing that. So we said, all right, let's do that. So we started with that, and then um, we have a couple pieces. Like we work with like um, Google for Business um, to amplify their business. So we make sure their Google Place is up to date. They can actually make reservations right from there. And so by having all the strategies, now patients instead of spending 45 minutes to find an immediate care facility, they could spend 10 minutes to find one with a lower wait time and pre-register, show up, get home within an hour. And that's kind of the premise, and we're not treating emergency patients. I mean, if you're having a heart attack, and you're, you're calling them a one. That's first and foremost. And we're not helping that, but we're helping the 87 percent of other immediate care appointments that are, are happening. Got it. That makes that makes actually a lot of sense in there. <laughs> that's a very, so yeah. a very useful service. And I think as as this conversation goes too, as well, like when you talk about telehealth, and the reason why it's we're we're staying um, kind of interconnected is we see it as well. Telehealth will always play a role. We'll start to, you know, help pre-diagnose some of those patients, but yeah. we know that some people are not going to get diagnosed because it's too immediate, and yeah. that those telehealth providers are going to say, "I need you to go to the urgent care. Hey, here's an ER." So we're going to work. We're already, you know, integrating ourselves where a patient's like, "Oh, I need to go to the urgent care. Here, I held your spot in line. Go to this location. It's two minutes away." So. Okay. Makes a lot of sense. So I have a question from uh, the audience, a boy. Uh, so he's asking, um, so for example, if you look at like, the business model, things like Teladoc, American Wall, so they, you know, why don't they just, here's a platform and go to healthcare systems or put the healthcare system doctor into a platform? Why do these companies like, almost have their own independent doctors and sometimes competing with the... the um. You know, I, and this would, this would be, this is a little, somewhat opinionated, I mean, somewhat not because uh, uh, my, uh, as a consultant, I've worked with a couple of health systems that have integrated uh, mm -hmm. either one of them or built their own, so on and so forth. Um, one of the reasons, you know, 2007, 2006, whenever the time frame was when they were founded, very hard to, have, to sell the health system. That delivery change was like way far down the road. You know, how am I going to deliver health care? It's not happening this way. I think psychiatry might have been the only thing that people were very interested in because uh, psychiatrists are already do using literally telephones at the time. So I think that they realized how hard it was. So they said, well, let me build my own network. And I think what I, I remember, and this is vague memory, like 2009, 10, somebody was trying to be like a find uh, an online doctor, then you could chat with them right there, right? I'm going to help you find it, and then you, could t you can talk to them right there. Um, I think that that was like the model. It was like, all right, well, I own the doctors. I'll I'll raise a bunch of capital so that then I can afford to have that model. And then as the market shifts, then I'll have less of those doctors and I'll integrate. 
So I, I think they're, they may be going down the road. I, I can't speak like, like I know that that's to be fact. Um, but, you know, that was the way they got in. I mean, we look at other models outside of healthcare, like the, um, the share rides like Uber and Lyft, and they, they had to spend a lot of money to kind of tear down barriers, right? Because it, it, playing nicely with the taxi cab guys just wasn't working. So same, yeah. same difference. Okay, that, that's nice insight there. So I have a question from Michael. Uh, so he, I thought this is a really intriguing question. So he's asking, is, so for example, like psychologists, psychiatrists, you know, these sort of therapy sessions that sort of tend to be sort of recurring in nature in there. So do you see for this market segment, if these people are more or less prone to sort of shop locally for a physician versus just sort of, even though telemedicine could be uh, done anywhere, but would there be a I, I think it, um, in that in that case, it's it's all about what the comfort of the patient is. I think you're dealing with something that's, you know, it's it's difficult, and that there's going to be a comfort level that the patient's not going to have. I think like when we have like a rash, we're like, oh, this is what it is. Like we're a little less um, uh, discomforted on it. But I think when you have a condition that needs to be managed, um, especially mental illness, um, that there may be that. I think you know, 20 years from now there'll be a much higher demand for it, and I think that you'll be able to have a weekly appointment much easier. Um, but I, I do think that there will still be a need to be in person because um, there needs to be more of a comfort level for the patient maybe to get out of, and this is me just talking because I have friends that are psychiatrists and that say that one of the things that works for them is that the patient is out of a comfort zone. They're not in their home. They're outside, so they're a little bit more vulnerable, but then they're opening up more. And so... Um, they can't speak specifics, obviously, because of patient confidentiality, but um, I, I think that will be something that they can have more sessions, but I, I do think it will be more local. Nice. Okay. That's, that's really interesting insight about, you know, deliberate use in the getting someone out of their home to get out of their comfort zone. I think yeah. that's... And, and, that's, and that's from opinion. I mean, this is a professional or a couple of professionals that I know uh, yeah. personally, and it's just more or less that works for them. It may not work for others. And it may not matter to others, but for them, it matters for them. Yeah, so we uh, we were just at the American Psychiatric Association conference like a month ago, so we talked a bunch of like So we felt like it, our prediction was almost like getting the person in in the on your you know in your office. There's like just so many cues in there, but then in the end of my country is going to be a little bit uh, maybe the first session in person that spring all these. I think well, this will play nice and, in the shop locally. And to segue that, I mean, there's there's one that's it's a little lot more niche, right? And so this is when I talk about specific events being the way you position your company. There's one that started at a university, actually here in Florida, and their goal was psychiatry for, for students, right? And because the schools don't have enough um, therapists on staff to help all the students, so they tend to take the more severe cases. And their whole goal is to make sure you know students lose, you know, get rid of that anxiety. They you know, you know, lower the suicide rate, lower the dropout rate, so on and so forth. So um, they started a platform that literally was just for the students. You could log in and chat with somebody right then and there um, instead of having to go. And they, they have huge utilization um, um, increases, which is they felt was great because now they can impact more students and help more lives. So Yeah, that makes sense. So I have a question from uh, Chris. So he's asking, so I know you have an AI uh, passion there. So he's asking, so the, with these so triage tools, you know, these AI platform like you know, Babylon Health out of the UK, you know, like they raised, I think, a whole lot of money recently in there. Now, how would these sort of AI, you know, the chat platforms sort of intersect with this telehealth? Right? Like, you know, do you, where do you see this more? It's like, ultimately, it will always be this more like sort of the direct patient doctor interaction versus or more like modulated by AI. Well, I'm I'm a huge fan of what AI could bring. I I kind of love what Babylon's doing. Um, they're I would say quite lucky in the kind of system they're in, being a, a national health system. Um, their partner is NHS, which is great. Um, they're able to use all the data from from NHS to be able to you know build AI. Um, I don't know how great it is. I try to use it once, and it just I'm in the U.S., so it didn't let me use it really. Uh, it let me a answer some questions. That was about it. Um, so I think that what AI really does for telehealth, it, it, it will kind of conjoin with telehealth where it'll be the precursor before the doctor talks to the patient or analyzes the patient's um, answers. Um, but AI could really, you know, help, you know, I, and, and don't hate me when I say it, help pre-diagnose or diagnose a patient that has a very um, um, low level of acuity, um, more of a common illness. And I think that once we can have that, 
Yet again, we go back to that shortage of doctors that we have. Now we can make doctors more specialized, and we don't have to worry about having a ton of you know, primary care or hiring more nurses. I'm not saying I don't want to. We still need to have good jobs here, and we still need human interaction. But I think that AI, 10 years from now, as long as it works the way it's supposed to and, and it has the right data being fed into it, that I, I really do think that, that a patient could go on, answer a few questions, then somebody's going to de deliver a Z-Pack to their door because that's what it diagnosed them with. I mean, that's, that's where telemedicine really, I think, comes into play. But, you know, I don't want to say AI is going to go too much further. I think AI then, the only other leap and bound it does, it then can help pre-diagnose any yeah. future events that will happen. That will be about it. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. So we have dabbled a little bit in the AI. So last year, we held a big conference, in fact, in Vietnam, uh, AI, telehealth, so I think we think of the future, right? AI a little bit, telehealth a little bit, to Amazon, drop your drugs, yeah. drones, drop your door. Hey, man, I'm, I'm all for it, man. You got, I think that, that's where, you know, digital health or health tech, if you want to call it, the, like the next really big, that's going to be bigger than all the healthcare companies out there, is going to be the guy that, or the, the company that has all of those yeah. built into it, into the experience, and then patients just will flock to them. I'm excited. Jeff Bezos, we're calling out to you. To you we are, we're coming to your front door. I'm telling you, you're coming. Yeah. So uh, we have a question from uh, Douglas. So he's asking us, um, how can telehealth consultants help the pharma industry to increase sales and increase patient interaction with pharma products? Um, you know, I, I think that, that's, I mean, does the pharma industry really need to increase too much? No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I, I think, you know, one of the things that it, it can do is, um, as we keep on talking about regulation and being able to prescribe uh, virtually, you know, I think that maybe even some of the pharma companies are almost, um, you know, sponsoring visits, if that makes sense, um, providing more education on a drug that could be life-saving to a patient. Um, getting more data to the pharma industry so that they know that their drug is actually working on X population or X lives. Um, I think that would be huge for the future of R&D for the pharma industry because, you know, there is a silo. We, we have it all over. It's, it's pharma, it's insurance, it's payer, and then it's the general public, right? Um, and then there's obviously government. So you have these kind of five pillars. Um, I think that the more in information that pharma gets, they could do more direct uh, research on something specific mm -hmm. as opposed to waiting for more grants or hoping for the next blockbuster drug. I and mean, they could do things on the fly as opposed to having 18-year life cycles, which is, you know, I mm -hmm. understand that's probably very difficult. Yeah, makes sense. So I have a question from John. Uh, so he's asking, so, so Alex, uh, what are done, like, you know, there's a couple of things you have done to sort of give the users an entry or digital help platform in the beginning, like assuming like you just create this little company in there, like you're trying to get people onto your telehealth platform, what would be the one to three things you would do? You would do? Um, so it all depends on how you're delivering it. Um, that's, that's obviously, so I think the, the first thing is um, trying to work out a specific niche so that you can get into the market and get patients. So, you know, whether it be diets or whether it be you know, cardiology or whatever, right? And so and it's something that you can legally do too, right? So you got to make, make sure that. Two, I have some great partners. So I always say one of, you know, in my, all of my experiences, one of the best things I did early on in any company I've been with has been having people believe in the same passions we all believed in. Um, and so I think that's one thing you do. So get one or two partners that are just like that. Um, especially if they have different skill sets. The passion can be the same, the skill set's different. So I think if you have those, those two things, and then three, start selling it before it's built, right? You need to know what your customer wants um, and how they want it to be delivered to them. I think that um, if you take more of a waterfall approach or you'll build it and they'll come, um, you will find yourself in a very, I mean, that's, this is old school stuff, right? And uh, you'll, you'll find yourself in a, in a vicious cycle of unsuccess, right? And so, you know, go out and sell it. Get people to start using a very MVP version of your software um, and then fix it later, right? Because you'll, you'll know what needs to be fixed. Okay, that makes great advice. Uh, we have another question from the audience, uh, Nakita. Uh, so she's asking about, so, so she's interested in creating a, a portal so I was sort of linked to opticians and the retina specialist so they can sort of help, you know, early diagnosing, retina condition and so on. So how will she go about, so she's not a tech person, how does she go about developing the secure 
like this sort of this platform? Do you try to hire engineers yourself? Do you just outsource? Like, how do you even approach you know, that? No, I would say if you're not tech, you should go and um, I mean, I would try to get a partner that's more of a developer or under at least understands. Like my partner at ClearCare, he was more of a security person, but he understood tech better than I did. Even though I tried to teach myself how to write software. Um, I was okay. <laughs> there are definitely people that are better than me, and that, that's okay, right? We, we, we all know, know our limitations, but um, you can't do it all. You got to make, make sure. So I, I would definitely find a partner, and then don't be afraid to outsource your earliest stuff. Um, you know, because your MVP isn't your glorified product. It's your MVP to get a few users to use it to then validate the markets there. You don't want to spend three years building something and then the market won't use it. You need to figure out if the market will actually want to buy your product. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. In fact, I, on the VC, we started like licensing a platform, all these things that, like, you know, a couple of years ago, we got into this sort of full server development. We just find a lot of our healthcare partners, they just felt like uh, they don't want to license a platform, hire their own developer, which is easy, just like outsource someone, just take the whole package for them. Totally. No, I agree with that. Um, so as we're coming to the end of the um, wrap of this webinar, Alex, thank you so much. For, I know there's a bunch of other questions who, apologies to audience members, we have like way too many questions that we're having there, but we're going to share this question with Alex. We're going to post your, his answers on the webpage, so definitely check in on that. And for next week, we have an amazing session. We're going to focus specifically using a focus around the telehealth, around the addiction, the opioid crisis, out there, different tweeting for that. And then if you like what we're seeing on this, we have our big uh, in-person telehealth failure secrets to success conference in the Silicon Valley on September 20th through 22nd. Definitely please look into uh, register, get the early bird registration. It's going to be phenomenal events for you guys. And then uh, I'll just ask three final wrap-up questions for Alex. The first thing is um, you share a lot of insights today. So if the audience can only learn one thing from you today, like what is that? one thing you want the audience to take away? Um, I would say the one thing I would say to take away is understanding that healthcare, especially if you're an entrepreneur, healthcare is a mindset. Um, you, your buyer, your consumer, the general public, I mean we see that today with politics that everybody's got their mind that they understand healthcare. Um, they may not, but they have what they, they think it is. So remember that when you're building your, 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 your business because you could spend a lot of money building a failure um, or you can spend a little money stopping failures, right? And so just just remember, remember the, that as a key mindset for uh, as you build your company. Great. Uh, so the next thing is, um, so what is something in telehealth that you believe but the rest of the world uh, doesn't believe yet? Um, so I truly believe that AI will diagnose patients. Um, I really think that that is what will be integrated into telehealth and that we will be able to automate a lot of the mundane things we do as professionals um, through AI and then that telehealth is going to be the biggest, it won't be telehealth, that's what will help really make it not telehealth anymore, just healthcare because that will then really kind of catapult the usage up because patients are getting results faster, they're getting answers faster and they're the right answers. I mean, that's the goal, right? It can't just be an answer, it's got to be the correct Answer me. I've I've done searches online for, you know, I, this thing is happening to my eye, and then like it gives me everything under the sun, and now I'm panicked, and my wife's like, let's go to the hospital, and I'm like, let's not, like, it's okay, it's gonna be fine. So I, I think that once it's the right answer, we're we're gonna be in the best shape we've ever been. Got it. Then the final question is: So right now we're in the middle of this uh, some pretty craziness on the capital, on the healthcare legislation. It's again, you know, assume we were like a, just put away the politics in there, forget about Republican, Democrat in there. So if you can sort of plan the thought into President Trump's mind, world, you know, the key senators, and like, what would be that one thought they would they shouldn't do that would have the biggest impact on the healthcare industry? Um, I would say uh, if they listen to the hospitals more than they listen to maybe the insurance guys, um, you know, I have the theory that insurance is a financial product and it benefits should never be healthcare shouldn't it should just be care. You should care for everybody around you. Um, that's I think that's actually what, what really drew me into the industry was that we were you know I read the doctor's oath you know years ago I can't recite it so don't don't put me on the spot and it was more it had nothing to do about making money and and being this big business that had more to do about helping people. And I think that we lose sight of that. So I think if DC could finally say, 
what do I do for the nation? What, what do I do for every citizen? Um, I think they would come to realize that it'll cost them less money to just skip all the BS and just help people and, and make sure they're taken care of and they get healthy because um, I, I, there's, there's less of a financial burden on everybody. Wonderful thing there. Alex, thank you so much for joining our webinar. I really yep. appreciate it. Thank that. you. Thank you for having me. It's been, uh, it's been fun. <laughs> thank you.